Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh for this wonderful opportunity to speak to you all tonight from half a world away down here in Australia. And as soon as I received the invitation, I knew immediately the story that I wanted to share with you. It's actually about a former president of the college who helped solve the very Australian problem of snake bite. Now, snakes might seem a surprising topic to talk about. Uh, they're obviously not a major theme in Scottish history. And I suspect the most notorious snake in uh, the UK's history, Black Adder, uh, interestingly enough, has two curious links with Australia. The first is actually that the first series of Blackadder was sponsored by an Australian television station in the late 1980s. And the second, more relevant to tonight, is that in a roundabout way, solving the problem of snake bite actually leads us directly to Edinburgh. And so it's in Edinburgh that we begin. It was a moment of astonishment for Thomas Richard Fraser, who became the president of the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh between 1902, uh, sorry, 1900 and 1902. Now he was a graduate from the University of Edinburgh and in 1877, he'd been appointed as the lecturer in Materia Medica at the university. Now the Materia Medica effectively became the science of pharmacology. It was about substances that had some sort of therapeutic effect but also tied in with toxicology as well. In other words, study, studying substances that had less unhealthy effects on the human body. Now, Thomas had this moment of astonishment in 1895, and he declared in one of his publications that there are few facts in the whole range of biology more calculated to arrest the attention or produce astonishment in the mind of the observer. And I know you're all dying to know exactly what he was talking about. Well, actually, he was referring to the process of rendering animals immune to the venom of the cobra and other serpents. It was a very hot topic in the 1890s, and it was part of broader developments in the field of immunology, which was then really only even starting to have that name applied to it. Now, this issue of snake bite was significant to Australians, even if it wasn't such a problem in Scotland. And it was definitely seen as a pressing concern here in the, uh, the southern colonies, as they were known. And just to give you a very brief background on Australian history, the very first Europeans colonised Australia from 1788 onwards. In other words, around about the same time as the French Revolution was playing out just across the English Channel. And at first, the white settlers here weren't afraid of the local snakes. They thought that they were probably harmless and they didn't really pay a lot of attention to the stories they were told by the local Aboriginal people. But by the 1830s, the Australian colonists had developed a growing fear of snake bite, and it became a major cultural concern through the 19th century, as you can see in this charming, rather naive illustration on the slide. Now, one of the questions I asked in my PhD, my doctoral research was on snakes and snake bite in colonial Australia, was, was this fear really justified? I'm glad that you asked that question as well, because in purely medical terms, the answer was probably no. Now, I've called this slide here lies and statistics, because as we all know, historical statistics are notoriously robbery, and it's particularly the case for a problem like snake bite. Now, it's often difficult to know if somebody's been bitten by a snake, and if they've been bitten by it, it's even harder to know which snake it was and whether it was actually a deadly snake as well. So any sort of reports of snake bite in colonial Australia are skewed by all sorts of factors. They're incomplete. Often a lot of snake bites weren't reported. A lot of things that were reported as snake bite may have been something else indeed. And of course, people may have been prone to exaggerating the effects uh, in order to get some treatment, which we'll come to in a minute. But to put it into context, over the period of 1880 to the 1920s, the population of Australia grew from about 2 million to just over 6 million. Through that same period, the number of Australians who died of snake bite per year on average was about 15. So in other words, it was an incredibly minor cause of death right across this vast continent. 
But of course, that doesn't mean that it wasn't significant to the Australian colonists themselves, because as we're finding with coronavirus this year, statistics are only ever a small part of the story of a medical phenomenon. And certainly when you go back and read accounts of the colonists from the 19th century, that alarm at encountering the local snakes was very real from the 1830s onwards. And so you can see in this illustration here by surveyor William Govett, that he was mortified when he stood on a snake in 1835. In fact, he said in his diary that his blood curdled at the thought of his imminent demise if that snake turned its head around and bit him on the ankle. Now, it was particularly important in Govett's case that he was being, that he was standing on a black snake, particularly the red-bellied black snake. Now, this black snake wasn't quite black adder, but in Australian folklore, the red-bellied black snake was considered the deadliest right throughout the 19th century. And in fact, the very fact that it had a red belly implied to the colonists that it, there was some sort of divine warning, some sort of message from God that said, this is a dangerous creature, keep away from it. Now, that led into the wider problem that we had here in Australia of how do you actually identify which are the dangerous serpents and which ones aren't? particularly in a crisis, like when you're standing on a snake uh, with your colleagues trying to chop its head off with a tomahawk. You can see here some of the ways that colonists learned about snakes in the 19th century. On the left is a poster that was put up at uh, suburban railway stations and in police offices to help colonists identify the hurtful or dangerous snakes in the colony. And also they could visit natural history museums and look at specimens. This is an American one that's in one of the Australian museums, but there were also uh, specimens of local snakes on display, precisely so that colonists could learn about which were harmful ones. But even looking at them here to an inexpert eye, of course, it's very easy to confuse, for instance, a copper-headed snake and a brown snake, let alone a tiger snake that might be dark in colour or being seen at night as opposed to a black snake. So despite these measures, it was often very confusing for colonists to know which snake they'd seen and which one had bitten them. Uh, they also had a lot of trouble knowing if any venom had been injected during the bite as well. We now know that many snakes will uh, make a dry bite. In other words, they don't want to waste their venom, which of course they use for killing and digesting prey. They don't want to waste that on humans if that they're trying to scare off. So they'll often do a sham or a dry bite but if they do inject venom, of course, we don't know whether the quantity that they're injecting is going to be lethal. And that leads us to yet another problem that the colonists faced, which was what was the very nature of this substance? What was venom and how did it act? Was it a single substance that was united across all snakes? In other words, was there just a single substance known as snake venom that was possessed by all species? or did it differ between different types of snakes? And whatever its uh, commonality, was venom chemical, microbial, or even germinal? And by that I mean, was it simply a, a mixture of, of straight inert chemicals? Was it a microbe as uh, we were discovering in the 1860s with the growth of germ theory? Or was it actually closer to what these days we might call a virus? In other words, some sort of molecule that enters the cells of a living being and perverts them for its own purposes and actually takes over the body cells. Interestingly enough, in the 19th century, it was often called snake virus as much as it was called snake venom. Not quite the way that we understand viruses today, but it was still seen as possible that this, this substance injected by snakes might actually interfere with the animal economy, as it was called, of human hosts, and lead to a permanent takeover of their bodies, rather than it being a passing uh, biochemical insult, as we might now understand it today. But if we were unsure of the nature of venom through the middle of the 19th century, its effects, its clinical effects, were reasonably well documented, particularly for snakes that were considered to be deadly. So somebody who was bitten by a snake, particularly a deadly one, might go through a series of signs and symptoms, including fairly rapidly, they would start vomiting. Uh, they then develop blurred vision and their eyelids would droop as the venom started to paralyze their peripheral muscles. If they'd had a more severe envenomation, they then um, suffer muscular weakness in their arms and their legs. And then gradually they'd have more and more trouble breathing as their respiratory muscles were also becoming paralyzed. 
Now that would then lead to coma and possibly death as well. This was a rather unpleasant sensation that might take 12, 24, 48 hours. So you can imagine that sense of imminent demise and the fear of succumbing to snake venom over that time. So not surprisingly, if you know anything about 19th century medicine, the treatment was largely symptomatic rather than etiological. In other words, it tried to treat what doctors could see rather than what they thought was the underlying cause. And to give you a case that's fairly typical for that century, I'd like to invoke um, Joseph Brown, who was a station master on a suburban railway station in Melbourne, one of the bigger cities in Australia, who was bitten by a brown snake in 1868. He thought it was dead. He picked it up to throw it away and found that he was bitten by it. So he went through that series of symptoms that I just described. And these are the treatments that were applied to him by the two local doctors who attended his case actually on the railway station. Firstly, they cut out the bite site. They actually carved into it with a lancet in order to try and remove the sort of the seat of the venom. Then they tied a ligature or a tourniquet between the bite and the heart in order to help prevent its, the venom spreading through John Brown's body. They then doused the bite site with concentrated liquid ammonia, as I guess they hoped that it would in some way sort of counteract the venom in situ. And then they gave him six ounces or about 170 mils of brandy laced with ammonia because they thought that might be a stimulant to perk up his constitution as he increasingly uh, became lethargic. None of these measures seemed to be working, so they continued with their therapeutic interventions. They then applied mustard pulses onto his chest in order to try and draw out the poison. Uh, then they waved smelling salts under his nose to try to rouse him back to consciousness. They then applied galvanism, in other words, shocked him with an electric battery in order to try to stimulate him back to life. And then finally frog marched him up and down the station in order to stop him from falling into a fatal coma. Now these were all pretty typical measures for a 19th century severe case of snake bite in Australia. I hope you're wishing that you'd been bitten now. When none of those measures worked, they resorted to this experimental treatment that required the calling out of a professor of medicine. And he injected ammonia directly into the veins of John Brown. Now, I don't know about you, but I certainly wouldn't like to have ammonia injected into my veins. Uh, and probably gives you some indication of the desperation faced by colonial doctors, but also just by colonial lay people who didn't have a doctor to call upon when they were going through those awful symptoms of snake bite. And yet ammonia injection was seen as a completely scientific remedy. It was devised and promoted by George Britton Halford, who was the first teaching professor of medicine in the Australian colonies and probably in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, he'd come in to the colonies in the early 1860s and focused some of his early studies on solving the problem of snake bite. Now, Halford believed that the intravenous injection of ammonia would stimulate the heart to make it pump more, uh, more uh, vigorously, that that would therefore increase blood flow to all the tissues that were being uh, lack, lacking perfusion, and also that it would actually help return energy to the blood cells. You know, that he felt that the energy of those cells was being drained by something in the snake venom itself. To him, this was a perfectly scientific remedy for this problem of snake bite. And he thought it was scientific because he'd tested it in dogs and then had experienced a rapidly growing number of clinical cases that were reported to him by doctors, but also lay folk around the colony of Victoria and other places around Australia. So these were developing over the late 1860s and certainly by the end of that decade, you'd find that quite a large number of colonists were carrying these pocket kits that included a hypodermic syringe and a little vial of ammonia, which was generally diluted about one in five in water before it was injected. And these became quite widespread, at least in, the, in Victoria over the 1870s. And they were used both by lay people and doctors alike. And when you read their accounts from that period, you see them describing the recovery of patients after ammonia injection as being miraculous. And in fact, the power of Halford's invention was described by at least one doctor as being almost godlike in its potency. So clearly there was a great deal of support for Halford's ammonia injection. That at least was the case in Australia. But he had some antagonists, particularly in British India. So Joseph Farah, who was one of the senior uh, surgeons in the Indian Medical Service, uh, believed 
that Halford's remedy was largely useless. He thought that Australian snake bites were relatively innocuous compared with the deadly snakes of India, particularly the cobra that we can see here. Uh, but he also felt that the ammonia injection was relatively useless and he tried it in a few uh, patient, patients and also animals himself. And so Feyre actually published some quite vigorous critiques of Halford's remedy, firstly in the Indian Medical Gazette, and then they were actually reprinted in the Edinburgh Medical Journal over 1869. So again, there was a Scottish connection connecting these uh, Indian and Australian doctors in the late 1860s. Now, Feyre's agitation led to a major inquiry instituted in India that led to two dozen Australian snakes being shipped to Calcutta, where they were used in animal experiments, comparing their bite with the bite of Indian snakes, and also a range of remedies, including the ammonia injection put forward by Professor Halford. Now, the results of this study claimed that, in, in, you know, that Indian snakes were much deadlier than Australian snakes, but they also showed that the ammonia injection itself was fatal, even if there hadn't been a snake bite. In fact, it was probably deadlier than snake venom itself. So not surprisingly, by the mid 1870s, ammonia injection fell out of use around the world, including in the Australian colonies where it had been so popular. But that created a problem. If this scientific remedy had been disproved, what to do if you were bitten by a snake? Did you have to go back to that whole long list of excision and ligature and smelling salts and poultices and so on to deal with snake bite. Well, yes, you did, at least until the 1880s, when a new remedy came on the scene. Now, in the early part of that decade, a German immigrant to Victoria, Augustus Müller, proposed the subcutaneous injection of strychnine as another snake bite remedy. And he had a partner in promoting this remedy, the local pharmacist, Matthew Sharprone. And they believed that injecting strychnine would produce physiological effects in the body that would directly counteract the debilitating effects of venom. So in other words, though, it was stimulating the body to survive the crisis until the venom dissipated and then the patient would return to normal. Now, as with the ammonia injection, uh, Muller's snake bite remedy sold widely in Australia, particularly through the 1890s. In fact, it really became almost ubiquitous. It was quite common to read about people uh, buying these little pocket cases that included, again, a syringe and the solution that they could easily make up and use in a crisis. You read new arrivals in the colonies talking about this being one of the very first things they purchased to protect themselves against snake bite. It was simple to use, it provided carefully measured doses, and there were over 100 successful case studies reported in the Australian medical press through the 1890s. So again, it was seen as a scientific remedy to an important local medical problem. And I think both uh, lay people as well as doctors adopted it because you can see the presentations here. You know, it was the new form of industrialized pharmacology that had really become quite popular by the end of the 19th century. But of course, there was always a risk with a notorious poison like strychnine that you could overdose while treating snake bite and actually kill the patient. And not surprisingly, there was increasing concern about this as the 1890s wore on. Now, that concern was seen in the Australian colonies, but also again in India. And in fact, and if you look at the data on this slide here, you can see that in most reported statistics, now, in the blue columns, the death rate amongst snake-bitten Australians treated with strychnine was actually higher than those who didn't receive strychnine. In other words, the cure was probably worse than the disease. Now, it's a little unfair on Mueller to say that because in most cases, strychnine was used as a very last resort. So in other words, the patients who received strychnine were probably at death's door anyway. And this was the last gasp to try to bring them back to life. But nevertheless, there was growing concern through the 1890s and in the early part of the 20th century that maybe injecting strychnine wasn't such a good idea, particularly in children. So it gradually fell out of favour in the early part of the 20th century. And it was at this time as well, particularly through the 1880s and into the 1890s, that medical scientists around the world came to appreciate that snake venoms weren't all the same, that each snake species had its own type of venom, and that that venom itself was composed of a mixture of all sorts of chemical agents that can include those that cause coagulation of the blood and others that uh, stop the blood clotting. There might be agents that paralyze the muscles. 
there might also be ones that were cardiotoxic that had a direct toxic effect on the heart as well. So we're talking now about a period where snakes and snake venoms were seen as an increasingly complex clinical problem requiring more and more scientific investigation. And at exactly that moment, we also see new approaches being devised to treat infectious diseases, but also snake bite as well. This was the evolving science of immunology. Now, in the United States in 1887, a physician called Henry Sewell had published results where he'd injected pigeons with small but then increasing doses of rattlesnake venom and rendered them immune to it. So in other words, once he'd gone through that process, he could give a pigeon a dose of venom much higher than would normally be required to kill it, and the pigeon would be fine. So he'd actually stimulated active immunity in that particular pigeon. Now, these results caused something of a sensation at the time, and were soon being explored here in Sydney, where I live, where a private investigator, John McGarvey Smith, certainly kept a huge number of snakes and started playing with these uh, anti-venoms uh, in his private laboratory in the suburbs. And also at the Pasteur Institute of Australia, which was established on Rod Island, which is just a few miles from where I live in Sydney. Lovely place to visit on a summer's day. So yes, you heard right, there was a Pasteur Institute of Australia. Now the first one obviously was established in France. The second one, in fact, the first one established overseas was in French Indochina in Saigon. So the, the very next one though, was established here in Sydney in Australia, not to deal with the problem of snake bite, but to deal with the rabbit plague that was causing enormous economic chaos here in Australia. And there was a vast prize being offered by the Australian colonial governments for anybody who could rid the continent of rabbits in that period. But also Pasteur, who was a great scientist, but also a pretty, um, pretty impressive hustler. He was a great uh, medical entrepreneur as well. He also saw an opportunity to come up with a vaccine for a disease that was known locally as Cumberland disease, but was ultimately identified as anthrax that was affecting the cattle industry here. So these were the reasons why he set up the Pasteur Institute of Australia in Sydney Harbour in the late 1880s. And we have to remember this was the very early days of human immunology as well, that really the only human vaccines we had for infectious diseases were for smallpox, but also rabies flagship vaccine, uh, sorry, uh, Pasteur's flagship vaccine against rabies. In Saigon though, one of his investigators, Albert Calmet, had been developing a snake bite remedy in the early 1890s. And his approach was to take a mixture of snake venoms and inject them into animals and then to drain off the serum from those animals. And he called this substance serum antivenomum. And I have to apologize for my appalling French pronunciation. But Calmet believed that this serum antivenomum was a universal antidote to snake bite. And that what it would do was to stimulate the tissues of the host's body so that they would actually then create conditions that would counteract the venom in the body itself. So he thought that this would work against snake bites anywhere around the world, in India, in Africa, and here in Australia as well. Was he right? Well, I'm glad you asked. That leads us to the Edinburgh connection that you've been waiting to hear about. Now, in 1890, Robert Wallace, who was the Professor of Agriculture at Edinburgh University, visited Queensland, a colony of Australia that's north of where I live in Sydney. And his visit, which was exploring uh, agricultural methods around the world, but also starting to look into these new uh, vaccines against animal diseases, inspired a local uh, Australian born called Thomas Lane Bancroft. Now Bancroft was a graduate, a medical graduate from the University of Edinburgh. And he became interested after Wallace's visit to think about whether active immunity could also be stimulated against some of the pressing local concerns here in Australia. Interestingly enough, his first experiment wasn't with snakes, but it was actually with ticks. Now the ticks that you can see here are often the size of a pinhead when they land on a host, but then they engorge to be much larger than that when they've had a good feed of blood. The problem is that the scrub tick also injects a toxin while it's feeding, and that can be fatal in children and in animals, although relatively rarely in adults. But that toxin itself, as Bancroft found, 
could actually be used if it was administered in small but then increasing doses. It could be used to generate an antitoxin that could then be given to a poisoned animal and would hopefully recover it from the effects of the bite. At least that was the theory. Bancroft wasn't always so good on the follow through. And so he basically conducted a few experiments and said, yeah, I reckon that will work, but let's move on anyway. So he never actually really completed those experiments. But what he did move on to was looking at the effects of snake bite. Now I mentioned he was a former University of Edinburgh student. So he sent some samples of snake, uh, snake venom to his mentor, Thomas Richard Fraser who by now was well established as one of the leading pharmacologists in the United Kingdom. Now Fraser by the early 1890s had heard about this acquired immunity. He'd read accounts previously about snake charmers in places like India who had claimed to become impervious to snake venom because they'd been exposed to repeated bites. And in his words, he'd initially thought this was tribal superstition. But as the scientific evidence grew through that decade, he started to think increasingly that maybe there was something in this. And so he gathered venoms from his contacts around the world. He was a very well-connected uh, Edinburgh physician. And he included amongst them not only uh, American, Indian and African venoms, but also a series supplied to him by Thomas Lane Bancroft in Queensland. And Fraser experimented with a whole range of these venoms, but amongst the things that he achieved was he managed to induce immunity to cobra venom in rabbits. Now, he was ultimately able to give his rabbits doses of cobra venom 50 times higher than you would expect to be lethal in them. And it was at this point that he made his pronouncement about the astonishing effects of anti-venom. And in fact, he coined the phrase in 1895, anti-venine. Uh, and that was actually telling. I mean, he gave credit to Calmet, who'd come before him in Saigon. But he called this substance anti-venine because he saw it as being a direct counteracting agent to snake venom. And he created what these days we call a polyvalent antivenom, or again, a universal one, which was sent off for trials in India and in Africa. It doesn't appear to have been sent to Australia though, interestingly enough, but what was critical to Australian investigations was Fraser's concept that this antivenine didn't act on the host's tissues, but that it actually acted in a more chemical method, uh, manner. In other words, that it worked to directly neutralize all of the substances in snake venom in the circulation. So it effectively counterbalanced them a little bit like an acid neutralizing a base, uh, a base. Now he shared that belief with Charles Martin, who was an Australian, uh, sorry, a British investigator who'd come to Australia at the start of the 1890s. And he'd rapidly taken on this problem of snake bite and ask these three fundamental questions that you see on the screen. What was the poison? What is its exact physiological action? And how can one best prevent or counteract this action? And so Martin, by the late 1890s, came to adopt Fraser's idea as well, that antivenines were probably the best uh, approach. He certainly dismissed ammonia injection and strychnine injection. And he thought that maybe this new technique of immunology held, held the greatest promise. And he was interested in it not only because of the problem of envenomation, but also because he saw plenty of other cases of uh, infectious diseases and the toxins produced by some bacterial agents like diphtheria. And so he often worked on both of these agents together, snake venom and bacterial toxins. And it was actually working on these in parallel that he developed his own proofs that antitoxins and antivenines worked by counteracting those agents in the circulation. In other words, it was the, uh, the injected agent itself that directly counteracted the toxin rather than stimulating the host's body to fight it off. And Martin, working at the University of Melbourne, in 1897 developed the very first antivenine produced in Australia against the venom of the black snake, which as you'll recall, was not the black adder, but was the most feared snake in the Australian colonies throughout that century. Now, Martin in Melbourne worked with his former student, Frank Tidswell in Sydney, to disprove Calmet's claim that serum antivenom was a universal snake bite antidote. Rather, what they said was no, antivenoms are highly specific. They only work against the venoms that they've been generated against. 
And so they tried experiments with serum antivenomo, it was imported into Australia, and they found that it really didn't work against the bites of Australian snakes. But what you needed to do was develop individual remedies for each of the dangerous snake types. So Tidsbell, for instance, in 1902, produced a, an antivenin against tiger snake venom, which was increasingly coming to be recognised as, in fact, probably the deadliest on the continent. But this specificity created a clinical problem because, as we heard earlier, there was this ongoing issue about how do you know which snake has bitten you? How do you know whether it's, uh, it's actually injected any venom if it did bite you? And how do you know which antivenin you need to call upon in a crisis? So that led Tidswell to undertake further investigations. And this is a bit of a busy slide here, but really the take home message is to look on the left and see that by around 1900, black snake bites were still the most commonly reported in Australia, although on the right, you can see that unspecified was actually probably more common, and that was a pretty typical problem. People didn't know which snake had bitten them or even if they really had been bitten by a snake. But Tidswell conducted a series of studies around this time which found that actually it wasn't the black snake Australians should be worried about, but actually it was the tiger snake. It had the deadliest venom. In fact, the studies he conducted while trying to titrate dosing for his antivenin proved that the Australian tiger snake had a venom even more deadly than the Indian cobra. So he was actually able to counteract the claims made by Joseph Farah 30 years earlier. But Tidswell also had to admit, rather sheepishly, that the fatality rate was very high for tiger snake bites, but for black snake bites, it was zero. In other words, even though it was common uh, to be bitten by a black snake, there were no recorded deadly cases. So effectively, Australians had been terrified for a whole century about a snake that probably wouldn't kill them. And that obviously reduced the need to come up with an antivenin against black snake bites. So that was all well and good scientifically, but where did it leave Australians facing their ongoing fear of snake bite? Well, I'm glad you asked. The typical Australian response 100 years ago and probably today was when you see a deadly snake, you pick up a big stick and try to hit the snake. Now that is a fairly pragmatic response, but it's obviously not therapeutic. And it was certainly a fairly lowbrow response compared with the cutting edge immunology of antivenines and antitoxins around 1900. And after all, the development of those antivenines led to a whole series of uh, immunizations that were rolled out in the first decades of the 20th century. So in other words, this was really important on a global level, but unfortunately it wasn't helping the, uh, the dogs and the bushmen that we can see in the illustration here. And in fact, there was a quandary, as you can see in this letter here, sent uh, by a health official to a doctor in 1906 in Western Australia. And I'll read it out for you. His reply says, Sir, Dr. Tidswell of the Department of Public Health, Sydney, has prepared a reliable antivenin serum, but I am not aware that it is procurable. The only other successful treatment is the hypodermic injection of strychnine in doses of one tenth of a grain. So in other words, he, Ernest Black here, was saying, well, there's this fabulous cure, but we can't get hold of it. So what I recommend is a therapy that was discredited about 10 years ago. So that really wasn't a great deal of help to Australian doctors in the early part of the 20th century. And they really came back to this major problem, that serum therapy created a tricky biological agent that was highly unstable in hot conditions, as in the Australian colonies, but also in India as well. It's what these days we call a biological. It was quite different from you know, chemicals like ammonia and strychnine that would actually stay stable in your little pocket case for years on end. Serum treatments were also expensive and also, of course, had to be made widely available, tailored to the particular deadly snakes in the area where they were being stocked. And that was all well and good, but again, we face this ongoing problem of, well, which snake has bitten an individual patient? And you could see the beautiful charts like this one were being produced and put up in schoolrooms around Australia well into the 20th century in order to help kids understand the risks that they might face if they went out into the bush. Those charts, as you can see here, also provided guidance on the treatment of snake bite. In other words, first aid. Now by, first, uh, by 1900, first aid for snake bite had tended to be seen really as the only effective solution and really came down to tying a ligature or a tourniquet 
And that seems fine. You can see there's some very practical advice given here. And this was in use in Australia really right up until the late 1920s when more scientific investigations were undertaken to show that in fact, as you can see on this hand annotated version, um, it was found out that ligatures are not very effective at preventing the flow of venom in the blood uh, if they're tied around the lower limbs because unlike the upper limbs which have one bone next to the main blood vessels, the lower limbs in the bottom of your arm actually has two bones which protect the blood flow. So tying a tourniquet around here really doesn't do much to stop venom uh, moving to the more important parts of the body like the heart, the lungs and the brain. So nevertheless, this was the best first aid available in Australia up until about 1930. It was also in this period that Australian antivenin production finally was able to begin. We were pretty behind the times in Australia in terms of developing a local pharmaceutical industry. And when we did, it was primarily chemical in nature rather than biological, which was required to produce uh, serum therapies. And in fact, we really only developed a strong chemical industry and a serum production industry after World War I, when we found out that actually our supplies from Britain, the United States and Germany were all cut off by hostilities, and we were at rapid risk of having no effective serums or even basic chemicals like aspirin in Australia. So one of the consequences of the First World War in Australia was the creation of an institution called the Commonwealth Serum Laboratories, whose job was to produce curative serums like um, smallpox vaccines, but also a vaccine against Spanish influenza in 1919, for instance. That was all well and good in the 1920s, but in the meantime, the only alternatives that were really available to Australians were the first aid measures I outlined before, and this curious little device as well. Now, these were little pocket kits that unscrewed. You took the lid off one end and there was a sharp lancet that you could use to cut the snake bitten spot, basically cut between the fang marks, the other end unscrewed and release some chemicals. They were called Condi's crystals. They were actually basically potassium permanganate. And you were meant to rub those into the wound in order to neutralize the venom chemically before it got into the rest of the circulation. Now these little pocket kits actually remained popular in Australia up until the 1960s, well after more effective remedies were put on the market. Uh, they were actually uh, inspired by a chap called Thomas Lada Brunton, who was a an English pharmacologist who really vied with Thomas uh, uh, Fraser as the most esteemed pharmacologist in the now United Kingdom in the late 19th century. So where does this all lead? Well, it's only in 1930, that the very first antivenine uh, against snake bite, against tiger snake bite, came onto the market in Australia. So that was really a gap of over 30 years between the first antivenine being proven scientifically to work and its commercial production. That was a long time to be lacking a leading edge medical intervention. It proved reasonably effective, but in fact, there were no further antivenines produced in Australia until well into the 1950s, which gives you some indication of how slow the market was, but also some of the technical difficulties in actually producing them. So curiously enough, the second serum against the bite of an animal in Australia that was introduced onto the market takes us back to Bancroft and his uh, exchanges with Fraser because in 1938, a veterinary antitoxin against paralysis ticks was introduced in Australia. So just wrapping up here then, what does all of this mean about Fraser's contribution to the problem of snake bite in Australia? Well, clinically, I think it's fair to say his contribution wasn't critical. But I think the most important part about the exchanges between Edinburgh and Queensland was their contribution to the development of fundamental ideas in immunology, and particularly about how serums generated against a toxin or a poison or an infectious uh, pathogen might actually work inside uh, animal bodies. And certainly that was one of Fraser's major contributions to the emerging science of immunology in the late 1890s, that uh, these agents had a highly specific action. They were targeted very closely to the agents that were used to generate the curative serum, but it definitely acted through the fluid and not through activating the tissues of the host. And so really this was a classic case of fundamental insights being developed from applied research. And so although it had little direct value to those of you in Scotland, 
it did ultimately have implications of global significance. And of course, we're reaping them today in the rush to develop vaccines against coronavirus. So I guess in a sense, you could say that Fraser's contribution to the problem of snake bite in Australia was just one more positive consequence of Edinburgh's medical diaspora. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk backslash heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.